Yeah, welcome back to International Taxation Part 3. This is um, a second edition because I got news that the first one was uh, strangely damaged or so, so that it broke after one minute and 50 seconds. Well, so I have the is it a really enjoyable task? I don't know. So I have now the task to tell you all the same thing again, but you have the first opportunity to listen to it. Well, um, let's now talk about the different kinds of taxes which I have explained to you, or where I told you that they exist last time. Let's look here again, taxes on income, taxes on wealth, and taxes on consume. Let's now talk about these three categories of taxes more in detail. And let's, um, let's say, analyze which problems they bring along or don't bring along in an international context. Okay. The first thing you must know is taxes on consume are mostly designed as indirect taxes. And that brings you in contact with another distinction which exists in tax literature, indirect and direct taxation. Now, indirect tax um, means nothing else than a tax where the legislator expects that the person who is under the law treated as taxpayer, so where the fiscal office collects the tax, will in the end not bear the financial burden himself or herself, but will um, transfer the financial burden of the tax to another person. For example, by adding the cost from the tax to the price, and where this effect is even planned by the legislator. So. An indirect tax has the inbuilt and planned effect that the burden of the tax shall be shifted on to another person according to the plans of the legislator. For example, the most famous example for value for um, an indirect tax is value added tax. It's intended to be borne by the consumers, but the legislator demands a tax from the entrepreneurs because that's far simpler for it. The legislator expects that if one demands a VAT of 19 euro for a net price of 100 euro, then the entrepreneur will just increase the price to 119, adding the, the, the tax to the price demanded, and so that in the final effect, the customer bears the financial burden of the tax by the high tri higher prices. Now, why is such a thing done? Well, the reason is simply simplification. Um, imagine you really want to tax consume, um, and you want to do it in a direct way. Then you would have to ask all the um, people in the population, let's say once in a month or so, what did you consume this month? Please give us a tax declaration for all the things which you bought and all the things, services which you consumed. Um, that would be an enormous mass of tax declarations to handle and it would nearly be impossible to control it because private persons do have no need to register their consume, so to prove where they spend their money on, it would be rather um, difficult to check their declarations which they hand in, and well, let's face reality, people would just lie, lie, and lie. So that makes no sense. On the other hand, somebody just came to the idea that, well, what the private people spend, so the consume of the consumers is the revenue for the people who sell them the stuff. So the revenue of the entrepreneurs is the consume expense of the customers 
And so you could just say, well, then we tax the revenue of the business owners. That's basically the same. If we can now guarantee that the business owners increase their prices and charge the increased cost by the tax to the consumers, then we achieved our aim. We taxed the consumers. But we have now to deal only with one entrepreneur and not with 1,000 customers. And additionally, an enterprise has a bookkeeping. And there we can even make checks. And um, we are already used to, from income tax and other things, to check if uh, in these registers and books something is missing or not convincing. So here we even have a realistic chance to convince, um, to find out if the people are cheating or not. With consumers, we would simply be helpless. So that is a great achievement. Well, um, the idea to tax consumers in an indirect way is not new, naturally. Um, for example, the most important example is value-added tax. I mentioned that already just now. In German, it would be called Umsatzsteuer. In the English-speaking country, it's called value-added tax. There are many, many um, different translations for that in different languages. Naturally, many countries took over the invention of a value-added tax. In addition to a value-added tax, you also have um, taxes on specific special goods. Often these taxes are called excise goods, excise taxes. For example, there is a tax on tobacco, the tobacco tax in German called Tabaksteuer. There is also in Germany a tax on energy, especially electric current, and um, I believe also covering the usage of mineral oil. Um, there is a coffee tax. A peculiarity here in Germany. In former times, there were even a coffee tax, a sugar tax, a tax on tea. Most of them have been abolished in 1992, around that date, uh, as a preparation for the European single market. One regarded that as being a bit out of time. And um, there was even a tax on light bulbs. Now, all these um, different kinds of products often had um, one common element in their history, because when these taxes were introduced, very often the goods which were taxed were luxury goods at the time when they first came up in the market. So tobacco, coffee, sugar, tea came from far away countries. and. Uh, some 200 or 300 years ago, when uh, taxes on these goods were first invented, they were the goods which the rich could afford, and so one could justify to tax these things. Um, light bulbs, even that strange idea, well, um, when the electric light bulbs were invented, that was a grave sensation for the people involved, because up to that moment, people had to sit in the evening around a candle, um, which uh, from time to time then burned down their homes. Um, on the other hand, electric light was uh, clean, didn't create smoke. It was uh, nearly some perfect thing. And so naturally also that invention, which first um, was good for the rich, naturally got taxed. And so more and more things got taxed. And uh, some things even were taxed additionally or later with the idea in the background to make them artificially more expensive so that demand could be pushed down a bit. For example, that is today's justification for keeping up the tobacco tax or for the introduction of taxes in many countries on um, drinks which or food which contain a high amount of sugar. Um, that is just to create a positive impact on public health just by making these goods artificially more expensive so that producers but also consumers have an incentive to reduce the amount of sugar and um, so in the goods 
which they produce. Well, all these indirect taxes became more and more and more and value added tax is a kind of final conclusion from that tendency of fiscal ministers to define nearly everything as luxury good and tax it. Because some 100 or 120 years ago, I don't know exactly about the history, some people who were wise and knew in human nature, especially the nature of fiscal ministers, uh, admitted to themselves, well, let's be honest to ourselves and others, the fiscal ministry will in the end just say even bread and water are luxury goods and should be taxed well, with a special tax. But does it really make sense to invent a specific tax law for every individual good and then learn many, many different rules on all the taxation of these goods and so on? Can we just, can't we just simplify matters by openly admitting that we tax now everything which somebody is going to buy with uniform rules, with uniform standard weight, and then we call that the tax on turnover. So everything which is sold will be taxed. And then that was evidently the underlying idea in return for the introduction of value added tax, one could then later, or one could then abolish all these taxes on specific goods. Now you know how such things work out in real life. Um, the fiscal administrations were great fans of that new tax. So turnover tax or value added tax got introduced, but naturally when you do something completely new where you don't know what's going to, um, if it's going to work properly, you insist in keeping the old solution uh, still for a while. So the idea was then we can perhaps think about abolishing these excise taxes later. And after a while you get used to collecting those taxes and then you probably never think that the time has come to abolish these other taxes. So uh, value added tax got introduced and the specific um, excise taxes were still kept up and only sometimes generations later the number of such indirect taxes on specific goods was um, cut down a bit by the abolishing, abolition of some unimportant taxes which one regarded as no longer necessary. Well, when you have so many indirect taxes, there is one fundamental principle which every indirect tax must follow, and that is not for constitutional or legal rule reasons, but that is because of economic reasons. And that fundamental principle is the principle that such a tax must be neutral for competition of the entrepreneurs. So the idea is if the state taxes two suppliers of the same good, let's say A and B differently, that would result in the removal of one of them from the market. And that would be unfair and that would make no sense. Um, so let's imagine how that could be understand made understandable. Imagine A and B are, before we introduce our tax, um, equally good. They produce um, the same good with the same costs, one euro per unit. So A and B can sell for the same price of one euro. Now imagine we introduce our tax now um, and we decide to tax A and B differently. So A shall be taxed with 5 euro tax per unit of the product and B only with 2 euro per unit of the product. Then let's calculate the prices for which the two can offer the good to the public. A um, can offer the product for 1 euro plus 5 euro tax, so 6 euro per unit, whereas a B can offer for 3 euro. Now we can ask the evident subsequent question, where will the consumers buy? And the answer is from B. 
A has no chance and has to close down his business relatively quickly because only an idiot will buy from A. And that makes clear that an indirect tax, which does not guarantee neutrality, equal treatment for competitors, will not work because the only thing which you can achieve thereby is just killing off half of your business owners. But in the end, all the ones who survive will be the ones who are taxed under the lower rate. So if you, it was not your explicit aim to kill the ones um, in the A category, you could directly have um, renounced on the 5 euro rate and extended it to all the suppliers in the market, then you would have created a bit less of jobless persons. So it's in the state own interest to practice a system which is neutral for competition. All other things will not work. No? Now let's uh, play around a bit or think about that principle a bit more. Naturally, we are interested in international relations, so let's think about the consequences from that principle in a cross-border context. Um, and usually one says that principle of neutrality for competition directly leads to the consequence that imported goods must be taxed at the border. Um, so that everyone who brings a good from the outside world to the inland will have to pay importation tax when that good come, is brought to the inland. Uh, how and why? That's relatively easy to understand. Whenever you want to understand why a law exists, remove it in your imagination and then imagine what happens. So let's for a while just eliminate the importation tax at the border and have a look what is going to happen. Imagine seller A and seller B live in different countries. Seller A lives in country A, seems to be reasonable, and seller B in country B. Um, and now as they are different countries and there is something like tax sovereignty, their taxes on the consume of that good will be different. So in country A, we have a tax of one euro per item. In country B, we have a tax of five euro per item. So the cost calculation of seller A will usually be one euro, cost tax one euro, price is two euro. Seller B, uh, a seller A can now send to customers in country B his or her goods for a price of two euro. Seller B, on the other hand, is subject to the legislation of country B, has to add a tax of five euro, comes to a price demanded for his goods, six euro. And now it's again a natural question, where will the customer buy from? And here, ladies and gentlemen, naturally, if you are a reasonable person, you have only one choice, you will buy from seller A, and that will lead to seller B dying out, being removed from the market, no customers, no fun. So the natural conclusion will be B vanishes from the market. And now imagine B is not only B, but B would here be in our case, um, the complete set of all entrepreneurs in country B. So if country B has an open border and country A has a lower consume tax than country B's total economy in that sector, at least where that good is sold, cannot survive. They will all buy out. So the only way of defense which country B would have would be to lower down the tax also to one euro. And, and now imagine country A and country B now have a one euro tax on the good, but there is still country C with a tax of 0 0.9 or 90 cents only. Then it's clear what happens. Everyone in the world buys from country C. Producers A and B are threatened by um, ruin, and so their countries must react. 
we end up with a race to the bottom and if we can reasonably expect that there is one single country in the world which does not tax that good, then you can only end up with a tax of zero on the product or otherwise your people die out. So that can't work. If you want to have an indirect tax, you have to draw the consequence that you have to tax the goods when they come into your country. Hmm? On the other hand, that principle that every good shall be necessarily taxed in the good where in the market where it comes to in the end, that leads to another automatic consequence in the country where the good is produced, which is exported, the export must be tax free. Because otherwise you cannot sell things successfully abroad if the other country has an importation tax. We can directly analyze this. Imagine there is no tax exemption on exports, but we have to deal with reasonable countries. So the country where the good is sent to will tax the, ex the importation. Country A again has a tax of 1 euro, country B a tax of 5 euro per item. Now um, country A's seller A has cost of 1 euro, the tax, well let's leave that question open. And uh, the tax of country A would come on top. Now seller A sends the good to country B, then an additional tax of country B of 5 euro comes on top, their local tax. And that means the minimum price for A is from that moment on, if A sells to a customer in B, 6 euro plus a local tax in the country of origin. Seller B also has cost of 1 euro, the local tax of country B, 5 euro, price 6 euro. And now we can draw a conclusion. How high is the maximum tax which that good can bear from country A before seller A would be kicked out of the market of B? And the answer is, if the local tax of A is only 10 cents higher than zero, then A would have a price of 6 euro 10 and B would be able to offer for 6 euro. So where will the consumer buy? And the answer is then the sellers of A from country A had no chance in country B. So taxing an export with an indirect tax is directly the same as forbidding experts. No chance in the country of destination if your export is taxed with an indirect tax. So, we can sum up the consequences from the principle of neutrality for competition. First, taxation will have to happen in the country of destination, because otherwise you completely ruin your market if you don't tax all imported goods. That automatically implies that border controls are necessary so that the system can work. Second consequence, which is also compelling, is that there is no taxation in the country of origin where the good comes from, because otherwise you kick your exporters from the foreign market. So all exports must be free of tax and what is often difficult to understand for beginners is that also requires border controls. And now you will ask why and because naturally there are not only honest people in the world. So if you tell your business owners, well, you can sell free of value added tax or free of coffee tax or free of beer tax. If you export these goods to another country, then naturally some people will try to tell you, well, we sold all these goods to foreign customers. Hmm? You probably know there is a marketing campaign going on from the German enterprise media market, media market from time to time where they say, we um, 
we reduce your or we sell you free of VAT. Um, legally, that's not possible in that campaign. They just realized that by renouncing on 19% of the price approximately. So they fixed the cost price correspondingly lower. Now imagine it would be able um, just to tell the fiscal office, well, we just told, sold everything to foreigners who then brought the goods outside Germany. Uh, then you could even pretend that it was legally possible to sell without VAT. And strange things would happen. You would enter a media market or any other shop. And uh, the seller would ask you ah, a question. Are you living here in the inland? And you say, yes. Oh, then I can only sell you that new luxurious TV set for 5,950 euro. If you now lived in um, Russia, for example, the price would only be 5,000. And then you immediately would say, ah, sorry, I misunderstood your question. I, I thought you asked where I live at the moment. At the moment, naturally, I live in a German hotel because I'm only a tourist. I will leave the country next week. And so, ah, if you really mean my country of residence where I live, then I'm naturally living in Russia. So, um, price is 5,000. People would lie, lie, and lie. Hmm? So, this is basically where the Dr. House movie series is absolutely right. When it comes to taxation, everybody lies if they have a chance. Hmm? Um, apart from the honest people, they commit errors. Um, so, in order to check if people tell you the truth when they talk about experts, then naturally you must have border controls. You must have an attestation by a state authority that these goods really left your inland, that they left your market, and additionally, that they cannot come back during the next night under the cover of the dark, unnoticed, and then Nevertheless, and in spite of that situation, finally end up in your own market. That is why you need a border control. And so that is indispensable for the working of the system. What does that additionally mean for international relations? Well. It's automatically compelling if we have such a system or if we have such constraints, economic constraints, which force us to say we only levy taxes in the country of destination and we take no taxes in the country of origin, then it automatically is guaranteed that there will be no double taxation of the same goods in the field of indirect taxation. So. That additionally means we never need international agreements like double taxation treaties in the field of consume taxes. Well, perfectly unnecessary. And um, that is why taxes on, no, international treaties on selling goods. never covered the question of double taxation. Double taxation is only a question for income taxes and inheritance taxes or taxes on wealth. There, something like that can happen. So now you can already understand why in the rest of the lecture we are going to concentrate only on the problems of inheritance, no, income tax, sorry, and none and perhaps a bit on the consequences of inheritance tax, but we never have to deal anymore with um, taxes on consumption in detail. What might happen from time to time is where the one or other conflict in detail might show up is taxes on services which are rendered in an international context because there it is probably more difficult to decide where the country of destination is. 
um, here an international coordination might make sense to a certain extent but that's not so frequent in former times it was even very rare so um, also there you don't have a need for international agreements usually the case will be that if a country fears its service industry will be taxed in its own country and in the country of customers then they will follow the rule that experts also of services must be left tax-free and they will just say and if the other country doesn't tax our service industry well that gives our service sellers only a competitive advantage over their people so it does no damage um yeah so probably also in the cross-border uh, context of rendering services no great problems will show up concerning a double taxation once you see that the double taxation really happens very quickly probably the state of origin of the service will react and renounce on the tax claim by changing its tax legislation for the future. In the EU, nevertheless, we have some common rules um, set up by the European Union's Value Added Tax Directive from 2006, which coordinates which a country has to levy tax on services and that then the others don't so that no service can ever be taxed twice at least if the rules are interpreted correctly. Um, that VAT directive from 2006 by the way is only a new version, a recast version of first versions which go back until um, or up to or down to 1977. Yeah. Now, just uh, to give you an overview, some additional facts on value-added tax, because that is more and more one of the most important taxes for the state budget. And so you should memorize and know at least the following things. First, what is taxed? And the answer is all goods and services which entrepreneurs sell to customers. And taxed are only all entrepreneurs, that is, owners of businesses within the scope of their business activities, so not in their private sphere, but everything what a business owner does during business, uh, be it the main business activity or be it something which you do from time to time in connection with your business, all that will be taxed under value-added tax. As far as these transactions are done in the inland, and when something is done in the inland is explicitly regulated in detail by the law um, to avoid any conflict of interpretation. Some things are declared explicitly tax-free, then they are taxable but not taxed, so not liable to tax. Especially as you can understand now, after all of our little conversation just now, all experts will be tax free. Then, for social reasons, some certain goods and services for, let's say, public welfare are declared tax free, health care, um, turnover, health care, then private housing. Um, and similar things. But when you deal with uh, these tax questions, you must know, and every, even a non-tax expert must know that, that tax exemptions, so the decision that something is left tax-free, tax exemptions are always an exception from a general principle. And the general principle is just and fair, everything is treated alike, and the tax exemption is a breach of that principle. Somebody gets a privilege. And that is why the um, interpretation of such a tax law always is made in a narrow sense. So that means you don't interpret a tax exemption in a wider sense. You just read what's there only where the text of the law really forces you to 
to grant that tax exemption. It will be granted. But if you do something which is only similar to something which is listed there, but not explicitly mentioned there, it will automatically be not tax free. So the idea is every tax exemption is a breach of tax neutrality. And so wherever the law does not force us to grant the tax exemption, it will not be granted. So if you do something which is only similar to something on the list, forget about the exemption. The tax base is defined in all European um, laws as the net price. So you don't compute 19% from the sales price, but you rather look to the calculation of the entrepreneur, which is the total of the cost plus the profit margin, and then 19% come on top or whatever tax rate a state demands. So you end up with the net price plus VAT rate is gross price. The tax rates in Germany, we have 19% and 7% reduced rate. The reduced rate is again only granted for goods and services explicitly named for that 7% rate. So if you sell something which is only similar to that entry on the list, it's automatically again back in the general rule of 19%. In other states of the EU, you also have standard rates and reduced rates. I believe at the moment in the EU, the standard rate varies from 17% in the lowest country to 27 in the highest country. EU law says that the standard rate must be at least 15%. And there are reduced rates under EU law. Um, a state can have one or two reduced rates, but very often there are some special permissions for some states that um, usually as a transitional rule, some further uh, reduced rates for very few goods can also be kept up for a longer time still. Um, well, what would these rules mean in practice? Let's have a look to um, a situation from real life and how it would be treated. Imagine an entrepreneur from Kleve in Germany sells a machine to a customer in Goch, which is near Kleve. In the purchase contract, he fixes a price of 119,000 euro. And how is that now treated under the VAT rules? Well, the first question would be, is the transaction taxable at all? So, is it possible that German VAT can be imagined? And let's check this. The seller is an entrepreneur, acts within his enterprise activities. The machine is a good and is sold. So we have a delivery of a good. Our seller does this not for free, but expects a payment in return. We can see that from the fact that he claims a price and the transaction is done in the inland um, there we are not going to go into the details, but I think from the circumstances, you can believe me, transaction is entirely done in the inland, so the affair is taxable. We should then, in a first, second step, check if the transaction might be tax-free, and I can guarantee you no tax exemption can be found in the relevant paragraphs of the German USDG, so the affair is fully liable to tax. If we now know that a tax will have to be paid, we need to compute it. And to compute a tax, you need a tax rate and a tax base. The tax base is a nice thing on which the 19% or 17% have to be applied. So the tax base is, in our case, the net price. That's everything which is paid. So the gross price minus the amount of VAT included therein. And so if the gross price corresponds to 119% of the net price, it's clear that we have a net price of 19% out. That we have a net price of 100% out of 119%. So net price is 100,000. Tax rate will be 19%. And so we end up with 19,000 tax. Um, 
Let's vary the situation a bit. An entrepreneur in Kleve sells now a machine to a customer in Moscow. And in the purchase contract, he fixes again a, a price of 119,000. And now we ask him how the treatment of the matter under VAT rules will have to be decided. The transaction is taxable again because uh, the transaction is under the rules of the German VAT law done in the inland if the machine or any other good is sent to the customer from the inland. And that has practical reasons because if somebody sells a good which has been stored here, the fiscal administration is highly interested in where that good ended up. Did you sell it to an inland customer or can you prove that it has been exported? So that is why they are interested in anything which was at any given time in the inland. And so that is why they ask you either that is taxable and will be taxed or you can prove an expert. Now in our case, our seller can prove that an expert has taken place and so no tax is due. The transaction is free from tax as an expert. Another case might be, imagine an entrepreneur from Kleve sells one kilogram coffee to a customer in Kleve. The gross price is 4 euro 20. And how would the matter be treated under VAT? Again, you would have to ask the first question, is the transaction taxable at all? And taxable means, can it be imagined that German VAT could come into play? The law says that's the case if the seller is an entrepreneur, acts within his enterprise activities, so not in private quality. A kilogram coffee which is sold is a delivery of a good. And this is now sold for a price, so for a consideration, and the transaction is also done in the inland, so all the requirements sorry, of taxability are fulfilled, we have a taxable transaction and it will be liable to tax if no tax exemption shows up. And surprise, you have never probably bought any coffee free of tax. So you will be not surprised that for selling coffee there is no tax exemption. So third step, we have to calculate the tax now. For that we need a tax base and a tax. The net price is again defined as the gross price, everything which is paid by the customer for euro 20, minus the amount of value added tax included in the gross price. And this is here 7% only because coffee is one of the goods which is reduced um, tax under the reduced rate. Evidently, a social motivation. Evidently, the persons who wrote our tax law had a problem in the morning with waking up and um, so they had the idea that uh, coffee should probably be a basic good which is necessary for living and should not be made too expensive by value added tax. So they got or gave coffee the privilege of being taxed at the reduced rate. Well, if now coffee, the coffee gross price corresponds to 107%, it's clearly that we just have to divide it by 107% and take it by 100%, then we have the net price, 3 euro 92. Then this is the tax base and we calculate now 7% on this amount, we end up with 28 cents. And if you add the two um, components up again, 3.92, and 28 cents, you end up with the cost price of 420, and that shows you, yes, you did it correctly. A restaurant owner now sells a cup of coffee to a customer in his restaurant at Cleveland. The price is 3 euro. How will that be treated? Again, we ask us for taxability. Restaurant owner is an entrepreneur, acts within business activities, has a guest in a restaurant is a service done to a guest because there is far more than just uh, drinking, getting a good. You get service, you can sit down, you can spend some time there and so on. So this is legally regarded as rendering a service to you. Now uh, there is no tax exemption, so you will have to pay a tax. And now the tax base and the tax rate, um, surprise, selling coffee, is something different than allowing you to sit down, serving you, creating a nice atmosphere and so on. So 
And getting the coffee served and prefer, prepared finally for consumption is no longer covered by the 7% rate rule for coffee. So 19% comes back. And so the gross price corresponds to 119% of the net price here. So the net price is 2.52 and the tax is 90% of that, so 48 cents. And if you add it up again and make the test, yes, it adds up to three euro again. We have made no basic calculation mistake. Congratulations to you and to me. Okay. So rather simple. Now, there is another important aspect of the value-added tax system in Europe um, because it's characterized by the right to input tax deduction or even input tax refund. If an enterprise owner who is liable to VAT on his or her output has sold something or is going planning to sell something, which will be taxable and liable to tax. Then that person can claim back from the fiscal authorities all the VAT, which is included in the cost of the goods and services which he or she bought as input for the production of the output. For goods and services which an enterprise owner buys, the VAT in the price will be refunded to that entrepreneur. This is a way to avoid a double taxation or more than double taxation of goods with VAT in the chain of entrepreneurs. And this is something which makes VAT a bit complicated or dangerous in practice. Uh, but it's necessary to guarantee the neutrality of the chain of entrepreneurs. And this is something which you probably also need to get demonstrated. Otherwise, you can't understand how it works and why it is necessary. Well, so let's have a look. Let's say production begins with enterprise A. Enterprise owner A has own costs of 100, so wants to get a net price of 100. Uh, by the way, the profit margin shall be included in the costs or they are all satisfied with having a profit margin of zero, makes no difference. Now we add a VAT of 20%, because 20% is, for such an example, far easier to calculate than 19%, and in principle, it makes no change. So A will have to charge a minimum price of 120. Now he charges 120, and now gives the 20 to the fiscal office. B is the next one in the row, and then B um, has own costs of 100 for labor again. Um, 120 cost of the raw material bought from A. Now B gets a refund, 20 included in the price. That leads to the following effect. The total cost of B is not 220, but 200. The VAT has been eliminated. B now makes a calculation and says, okay, 20% come on top, so my minimum price is 240. The now half-finished product is sold on to the next in the sequence, C, and the money for the output, VAT, is transferred to the fiscal office. C has, again, an input tax refund claim, so if C makes his or her cost calculation, all labor costs shall again be 100. The cost of raw material is 240, but 40 are refunded by the fiscal office, so the total cost is 300 only. 20% come on top, so that is now 60, and the minimum price for which C can sell is 360. Okay. Seems to be plain and simple. It's a kind of a ping pong game. One pays to the fiscal office, the next one claims the money back, pays to the fiscal office, the next one pays the money, gets the money back, and so on. But when the final consumer comes, a consumer has no refund claim, a consumer ends up with bearing the tax. And that is the intention of our tax legislation, actually. 
Now, why do we do it this complicated way? Well, abolish the mechanism for a moment and think what happens. Imagine A now has to pay 20 euro to the fiscal office, sells to B. And B has now no refund claim, then B has cost of 220, because now the cost of the input of the raw material have risen 220. So we have now 220, the VAT is now 44 on 220, the minimum price increases and goes up to 264. The 44 go to the fiscal office. C buys from B raw material for 240. The own costs are again for labor, hours, and so 100. Um, now we have cost for the raw material, which was bought from B, 264. So the calculation goes up, and the desired net price must now be 364. VAT is far higher than in the former example. And the final minimum price is 426.80. Now one could say, well, this is far better than before, because now the uh, total amount of VAT, which has been charged and collected by the fiscal office, is far higher. So the state should rejoice. But why don't they do it this way? Well, imagine there is a competitor. That competitor is D. And D does everything alone. D, or even DD, that is German for Scrooge, McDuck, Dago McDuck. Imagine DD is somebody who does everything on his or her own. So D produces everything from the beginning to the end. And so the own costs are only the labor costs. So 100 plus 100 plus 100. So D can say, my desired net price is 300, VAT is 60, minimum price 360, that goes to the fiscal office. Final consumer can get an offer of 360. Now imagine A, B, C shared the work, distribution of labor. They specialized on certain steps in production, became very good there. And, but they shared the work. So the one mined the iron, the second created the steel, and the third made a car from the steel. But uh, the alternative was DD, a kind of monopolist, has the mine for the iron, owns the factory for the steel, and also owns the car factory. He does everything on his own and does never cooperate with others. Now, DD could offer for a far lower price, just due to the VAT system's conditions. And now the question is, where will the consumer buy? And the answer is from DD. So if you don't have such a refund system in the chain of entrepreneurs, you program an effect that you just erase all the small enterprises from the market, and you, that you just erase or forbid indirectly any specialization and distribution of labor. In the end, what you create with a VAT system without a refund system is that you create artificially, just by the tax conditions, one single big enterprise which owns everything and the rest of the population is either jobless or works for DD in the end. Uh, by the way, the last guy who really prognosticized this would end happen in the final stage of capitalism was Karl Marx. And most, at least Western um, fiscal ministers, have that inbuilt instinct that their fiscal system should not uh, work in a way which was prognosticized by Karl Marx or should not produce that final stage of capitalism, which even Karl Marx um, could foresee and naturally didn't see as a positive development, and it would not be a positive development. By the way, even if DD could produce for 110, so even if A, B, and C 
were better, then the consumers would still buy from DD due to VAT. So it would even um, work against people who work more effectively than the monopolist. And that is something that also economists can't tolerate. So for economic reasons, you need such a VAT system with a refund. Yeah. What you also should know is that VAT is strongly harmonized by European Union law. So you have EU directives on value added tax, which order the member states what they have to write into their value added tax legislation. And um, the orders made by the EU have become more and more detailed. Nowadays, approximately 90% or even more of the contents of a national VAT law is regulated by underlying directives from Brussels because one has understood that otherwise in a common market the enterprises could no longer work successfully. Um, the legal base here is the, the right of the EU to harmonize rules for indirect taxation as far that that is necessary or advantageous for the single market. First directives were made in the 1960s. Later, the 1960s were just beginning with the um, order that every member state should have a value added tax system with refund. And later, more and more details had to be harmonized so that a more intense um, cross border trade could be made possible. The current situation is characterized by a single directive which has um, assembled and updated all the current or most of the existing um, requirements made by EU directives until then. That is the VAT directive from 2006 and it gets regularly updated whenever a new problem has to be solved. Um, the competent institution to interpret most VAT rules is because it is based on European Union rules, therefore the European Court of Justice and not only national courts. Um, if you want to get familiar with that a bit, the homepage of the European Court of Justice is www.curia.eu. Um, there you find ECJ judgments translated in all official languages of the Union, namely, conveniently, in English, too. So you can make yourself familiar with these things. A common interpretation, naturally, is, nat is necessary because if you agree on a uniform rule for 27 countries, that makes no sense if you do not um, secure that afterwards the uniform rules are also understood in a uniform way. Otherwise, you just have a common text and a chaos and a different practice in every state. So then you would have no harmonization, but only you would have an illusion of harmonization. And that's something fundamentally um, more and more, you also need cooperation between the member states. For example, exchanging information which is necessary for control. And so in the course of time, because that is often done by computer systems, you also need harmonization of any technical details. Um, and also certificates of expectation. For example, if a good is exported from Germany, to Russia, then it would leave the EU on the Polish border. And naturally, then a certificate of attestation can only be issued by the Polish authorities. So it must be harmonized in a way that the German authorities are able to read and understand an exportation certificate, which is also issued by a foreign state and not only by their own customs authorities. Well, that shall be enough for today. I thank you very much for yeah, 
staying alive till the end of this video and I hope you um, enjoyed it a bit. If not, then enjoy now that it's over and I hope you stay faithful to the channel. Thanks very much, till the next time and goodbye.